Okay, everybody, this is lecture number one, uh, day one, lecture one of the operating systems course. And uh, this little lovely picture here comes out of the textbook that I recommended. So if you look at the previous video I just did on the course introduction, you'll see the link for the textbook. This is the author's textbook slides. However, I don't normally talk to the slides or from the slides. I use them as kind of uh, something for you to look at, <laughs> visual aid as I walk through. So what I'm going to do is give you pretty much a detailed overview of the course, which is really much, pretty much lecture number one. So this week and uh, today we're going to talk about what operating systems should do, what they do, what they systems do. Um, computer system organization architecture this is not a complete computer architecture course. However, it probably gives you an idea if you're interested in taking a computer architecture course, what that might or should include. Uh, looking at operating system structures of the organization, the concept of process management, memory management, storage management, and uh, all of the different things associated with operating systems in terms of the concept. So a little tour of the major operating systems components and providing you some coverage of the basic operating system organizations. So what is an operating system? That's kind of interesting because on the final exam, last time I taught this course, actually I do this all the time because I, I teach this at a couple of different universities, and the question I really love to ask on a midterm exam is, give me three examples of an operating system, three operating systems. Identify three different operating systems. And the classic answer I get is Windows, Mac, uh, Unix. And then I go, well, okay, that's interesting. So those are not three different types. So let me, let me rephrase the question then. So give me three different types of operating systems. And I usually, long story short, I phrased the question wrong. No, I'm not done. You're, you're all describing the same type. What are you describing? You're describing PC operating systems, personal computing operating systems. Those would include Windows, Linux, DOS, MacBook. Those are all the same type of operating system. Ah! So now she's, she's venturing out into a different type of operating system. She's looking at an embedded mobile device operating system, different type of operating system. All right, so when we think about operating systems, if you walk away with anything today, next time you look at your microwave oven, think operating system. <laughs> next time you look at your watch, think operating system. <laughs> Air temperature controller on a wall, think operating system. Uh, your car, it's got an operating system in it. You know, every single electronic component out there that's computerized, not a mechanical, but like a computerized, has an operating system. Your printer has an operating system on it. Your mobile device has an operating system on it. So now if I asked you again, give me three different types of operating systems, most people say, my cell phone, my microwave oven, my car, my watch, my tablet, my computer, all these devices. Well, you can name the devices. I mean, on the computer, we already have Mac, Windows, I don't know, like eight, eight or nine different versions of Windows at this point. Uh, Linux, Unix. Actually, for as many Windows versions, there's as many Unix versions, too. Or Linux versions. Linux and Unix are kind of similar, but they're really the same operating system for most respects. And, of course, now people will yell at me at YouTube, no, they're not. Um, and then also take everything I say with a grain of salt. It's just kind of, you know, ab-libbing here. Uh, people's impressions of operating systems change, too. As an example, Java. Is Java programming language or is it an operating system? Well, it actually started out as an operating system for printers. So did Smalltalk, actually, at one point. And then we turned into different printer languages. So your printer has an operating system on it, too. And then we start looking at, well, what's the difference between the operating system and the programming languages? And then we think, well, then we have different API support for different operating systems for different programming languages. Here's a classic example. If you're going to program in .NET, you're not doing it on a MacBook. <laughs> you're doing it on a Windows operating system. Why? Because .NET is Windows. Only Windows. Only works on Windows. You're going to program in Java. Well, Java is a programming language. Do we have operating systems written in Java? Yeah, BlackBerry is written in core Java. Uh, we have actually a couple of other ones out there. Then we have different versions of Linux slash Java Android. Android is a really a Linux variation with some Java kind of embedded into it. 
don't quote me on this either, but it's kind of a hybrid, although it is a unique operating system in itself. Well, it's a unique operating API environment programming interface too. So you can take an entire class on that. I just got done with that last term. <laughs> so, so when we program Android with Java, <laughs> why do we do that? Well, because it kind of it's a marriage gone happy. You know, it's a really happy relationship between the two languages or the, between the two operating environments. And then you have, you know, well, when you write Windows, you know, Windows you can write Java, you can write C++, C, Python, Perl, PHP. It depends on what you're programming and what kind of interface. So. The operating system itself is what's riding on top of the hardware. It's what's making the hardware visible to the user. So if you want to think of that as a nice definition of an operating system, it's nothing more than the interface to the hardware. Because if I had a phone, as an example, and it was just the hardware, not going to do very much for me. <laughs> or a watch or a microwave oven. Let's talk about a microwave oven, actually, because that's a simple example. Not doing very much for me. I gotta stick an operating system on there to give the user some menu options, you know. And on a microwave oven, we don't have a keyboard, but we have a touchpad normally, you know, it's a start button, a popcorn button, you know, <laughs> temperature buttons and stuff like that. Well, that's the user interface, that's the UI. So if we put that on a desktop computer, probably not gonna sell very well, although you can call it a tablet and it probably would. <laughs> uh, instead, we have to have, uh, you know, mouse interface, keyboard interface, all sorts of other user interface components. So I mean, if we dissect the whole thing out, we have our UI, we have our operating system, we have an underlying hardware that's underneath it, and then we have this thing called APIs, you know, application programming interfaces or user applications. So usually on the first day of operating systems class, I usually have to distinguish between two different types of applications and programs that are running. We have systems programs and then we have applications that run. And well now we have apps that run. Which is kind of interesting because the app is like the hybrid in between a systems program and an application. It's kind of in the middle. And why do I say that? Well because it doesn't run on top of the operating system, it runs with the operating system. <laughs> Systems programs run with the operating system 100%. Applications, they run on top of the operating system. Apps are sort of in between. They're running on top, but they're also running with it. Because if we start looking at the compo composite of the app, I mean, we're looking at, you know, some of them are looking at content providers of the phone. Some of them actually can work the hardware. They make, it, make a call, receive a text message, send a text message. They do all sorts of interesting things that turns them into systems programs. So by definition, the operating system is beneath the system program, and we have what's called a system call interface that goes from the core, of what rides on top of the hardware, to another level that comes on top of it that allows us to run systems programs, which are utilities. And then on top of that, we have our applications. So application programmers, they just write Windows applications. So they just write you know, applications in general. App developers are pretty much doing the same thing. Unix people, they're writing system programs, scripts, or they're writing stuff that you know, works directly with the operating system. So we have this layered, nested layered approach that goes on. So I use the word nested there, because inside of the lower levels, we have more nesting. What does nesting mean? Multiple components that are all working together simultaneously along with each other. And then we have layers of this stuff that goes on. So most users only see the top layer. And on a PC, the top layer is the desktop. So it's a desktop. Well, it's your Windows. It's what people call Windows. <laughs> it's what people call the Mac. Well, it's a desktop. So underneath it, all the same concepts exist, which is kind of interesting. So we still have Process Manager, CPU Scheduler, uh, I.O. support. We have all, have all these utilities that still exist underneath the hood or underneath the, the system level, or core level. So what does the textbook describe it as? Operating system is a program that acts as an intermediate level between a user and a computer itself. Well, that's pretty on par. So it uh, rides on top of the hardware, gives you your user interface. The goal of the operating system is to make the hardware functional, make it make it do something. Also solve problems, which is kind of interesting. So the design of our operating systems are very 
efficient towards what they're supposed to be doing. So classic example, the desktop, ver the desktop computer versus the microwave oven. Now when you walk away, you'll be like, I'm just working on a microwave. <laughs> you are. You, you learned how to, you spent your entire life learning how to operate a microwave. So, or a VCR. You know, that's another operating system. That's a hard operating system to operate. VCRs, video recorders, DVD players. Those are operating systems as well. <clears throat> so, what do you do? Well, on a desktop computer, we have more RAM. Why? Because the user wants to load more stuff simultaneously. All right, so they're reading and writing more stuff in memory. So we don't have as much RAM on a microwave oven, but we have faster I.O. access. Why? Because you know, on a PC computer, we don't necessarily have to have fast bus speeds because, uh, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Unless you're reading and writing from a secondary storage, you know, a mouse movement, that could be pretty slow, actually. Or a touch, you know, a touch pad or something, that could be pretty slow. It doesn't really matter. But on a microwave, it has to be quick. <laughs> You gotta queue all that stuff up. Because what if the user presses this, this, and this, and start? I want the thing to start immediately, right? So you have different designs of the system for different benefits. The hardware on a microwave oven is for durability and for lack of errors. You wanna make it so it's easy. So the design of the operating system, quick, easy, no errors. No, I'm sorry, you pressed the wrong button. It's not gonna come up on a microwave. On the computer, it's to enhance the user's experience. So it's how many programs can they run simultaneously? So the more memory and the way you, how fast is it? How does fast as the windows open? Do they close? Can you save it? Can you open it? How many of these things can you run simultaneously? Stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting. The design of the user interface and the design of the operating system is for the purpose that it's doing. So there's a lot of memory on printers, actually, because you've got to queue up the printer jobs and stuff. So, and they have, to hold, they have to store fonts and stuff like that, cached information. So what I've been describing is the structure of the operating system. So what components does it have? How is it structured? How is it designed? What is it going to be used for? So we have different architecture. And so usually if you're a computer science major and you're an undergraduate computer science major, you take this class before, well, sometimes after, probably preferred after computer architecture. Computer architecture in the old days, you used to take a PC, take it apart, put it back together, make your own PC out of it. Nobody does that anymore. You just have these boxes. <laughs> you open the box, you violate your warranty. <laughs> you don't open up the box anymore. So in the old days, you built it from scratch, and you actually saw the pieces. And what do you see? You see memory components, a bus, uh, I.O. parts, a VGA card, VGA RAM sometimes that you can add and change. Um, you know, you got your little ports for the I.O. devices for mouse or keyboard and stuff. And you got all little pieces of the hardware, which is kind of interesting because you want to build a computer structure around the hardware because really that's what the operating system's job is to do is make the hardware usable. So then we have drivers. So then in our computer architecture course, you learn about these drivers. And then you learn, well, how when does the drivers get loaded? And then usually earlier on in that course, you figure out, well, there's got to be some central controller. And then you realize, oh, okay, we can build some stuff on it, and we can call it a BIOS. Right? So the entire computer, all those pieces can all be put together and stored in the memory on the hardware. And then when you turn the power button on, <laughs> the BIOS can be read. And then we can put all things together, kind of create that abstraction of everybody working together on this computer. And then we figure out, well, but then we need an operating system. And then we figure out, well, we can take a secondary storage device, which is actually kind of interesting because most operating systems are stored on secondary storage. In the beginning, they were stored on the hardware. And then they went to secondary. Now we're going back to the hardware, believe it or not. Tablets <laughs> stored on the hardware, faster on the hardware. So one of the things we'll look at when we talk about memory Anything the closest to the CPU is the fastest. So desktop computers are pretty slow, really slow, actually, because you're looking at us. Even if you make a flash drive, put a flash drive on that sucker, flash drive is going to be a little bit faster than our old hard disk, but it's still secondary storage. It's not stored on the board, so it's not primary. Long story short, slower. So you got to go out. The operating the BIOS has got to go out and find the disk. Make the disk, turn the power on on the disk, <laughs> get the disk spinning, read the disk, load the operating system up in the memory, 
and then start the computing. So that's why tablets are a lot faster, because it doesn't have to go out and look for anything, find anything. It just doing, 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 just as fast as the BIOS loads, the operating system loads, which is not bad, actually. So we're coming, we've gone full circle, because we started out with what was called thin clients, and then we got fat. Now we're on a diet, and we're getting thin again. <laughs> Seriously. So the thin client, and this talks about the desktop operating system, actually. It didn't have a hard disk. It didn't have anything. It was real thin. It was just a monitor and a keyboard. It didn't even have a mouse back then either. You know, turned the sucker on, it connected to the internet, and then it, it was a terminal, essentially. You, you provided with terminal services. Not much of an operating system, so they called those thin clients. And then we got bloated. We got fat. We got a hard disk on us. We got memory on us. We got a VGA card on us. We got all this crap on us. And then what ended up happening is the computers got bigger and bigger and bigger. Remember those like little desktop replacement things? Which was ridiculous. I think, why in the world would someone want to carry that thing around with them? You need like a suitcase to carry that thing around. So then, uh, and that got, that's considered a fat client with a full blown operating system on it. So then now we've gone full circle and we're coming back to the thin route. Take it all away. What do we need a hard disk for? Get the cloud. Connect to a cloud. What do we need all this VGA stuff for? Don't worry about it. Optimize the graphic card and the capabilities. Take all this memory away. Do all everything. So now we've gone full circle. Now we're back to thin. We still have an operating system on there, though. So the hardware of the operating system has changed. The operating system functionality has changed. The components have moved all over the place. But we're still working with the same kind of desktop environment. So all of those generations of, of desktop computers, thin, fat, medium, whatever, they're all the same breed. They're all doing the same thing, which is kind of interesting. Tablet, however, kind of poses a slightly different change from the norm. But uh, I'll talk about that later on in the course. But uh, So the computer system structure itself is what I've been describing. Thin, fat, different, you know, it doesn't really matter what you got. You got something controlling it. Would you have a hardware, CPU, memory? Usually you take an architecture course and you learn all the different components. The computer system itself could be divided out into four different components. If you talk about the computer system being in the operating system as well as the CPU and the memory and the I.O. devices, then you got more of a um, more of a full package in terms of what, what you're looking at. Controls, coordinating the use of hardware, among different applications. And then we have the application programs that run on top of that. So word processor, compilers are application programs, web browsers are application programs, which is actually kind of interesting because uh, Chrome, let's talk about Chrome as an operating system. We took the application programs and we put it inside of the operating system. <laughs> Chromebooks. Why? Because everybody uses the computer for the same thing, which is kind of like the trend of tablets. If you all use it for the same thing, put the web browser, put all that stuff inside of the operating system, turn it on, and what do you do? You have web browser. That's about it. Email, web browser. So isn't that kind of like Windows 8, the RT version? Put it all inside of the operating system. You turn it on. You can't install programs on Windows 8, actually. You can install apps from the App Store, but you can't put programs on there because there's no program support because everything's embedded inside of the operating system, which is actually kind of nifty. It runs faster. It takes up less power, smoother, faster. It's multi-purpose. Yeah, you can use it for email, you can use it for web surfing. So if we take a look at the big picture, all we're talking about with these different operating systems is moving around the components a little bit. So instead of the stuff being out here, we put it in here, we put it in here, we put it down here. Hard to put it on the hardware. <laughs> so put it in the operating system. Now. And then we got Chrome, we've got Chromebooks. Can't do much to it. Can't change it. So this is how we got fat. So in the beginning, when we were thin, we had thin clients. Everything was in here. Actually, everything was run from the hardware. Hardware went out to the internet, connected us to a terminal, connected us to a Unix system, and we had everything was running on a server, like some boxes. Then when we got fat, we just start loading stuff on top of, take it out of here, put it over here, put it up here, which means now we have more flexibility. So now we have this ability to like have different text editors and different assemblers and different programs and different database systems and all that stuff loaded on top of it. Gave us more flexibility. And then we got bored of all this flexibility, I think, so now we're going back. I mean, doesn't everyone use the same web browser these days? 
<laughs> no, Firefox, Chrome. I, mean, I don't want to go into a web browser war, but there's not that many choices out there. So same thing with the email. And isn't everyone on Gmail these days? Isn't Gmail control the world right now? So maybe some people are still on Yahoo. Who knows? But uh, even I too emails Gmail. Most companies are doing Gmail. So aren't you just going to support Gmail? Which is how Chromebook can actually be sort of successful. If you're just going to buy a computer to check your email and surf the internet, what do you need a what do you need everything for? So the Chromebook is actually what I call the thin client. It's just an operating system, that's it. There's no applications on it, there's nothing. You just actually turn it on, it comes on. Just like a tablet, actually, but it has a keyboard. And it has a, you know, it has the abilities, a mouse and stuff on it. But really, it's just a thin client. It's like something we had 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's just come back. It's all come back around, so. Which is kind of funny, because people used to spend a lot of money buying computers, and they spend a lot of money buying software on the computer. Now you just buy, you open it up, turn it on, use it. It's nice, personally, because, you know, the computer is just like the microwave oven. It's an appliance. <laughs> so, you know, people don't, will, will disagree with me on that one, but I don't know. It's just like the car, actually. What's the difference between a microwave oven and your desktop computer? It's pretty much the same thing. So, operating system definitions. We have the OS is the resource allocator. And we have the OS, which is the control program. Kind of like the way the BIOS is for the hardware, the operating system is the control for the user. So it gives you access to stuff. If the operating system doesn't know about it, you're not going to know about it, which is actually kind of funny because originally when some of the smart, um, smart memory came out, or what do you call it? Oh, um, well, we had different memory management modules and things, you know, like when you get past like 8 gigs or so, there was different configurations. And depending upon, or let's say for example, multiple CPUs, that's a better example. You stick some hardware and you stick multiple, you, you solder on another CPU or you buy a board that's got multiple CPUs on it. And you put Windows XP on that computer. You're only using one CPU. <laughs> the rest of them are getting dusty. Because the operating system, XP doesn't know about multiple CPUs, which is actually kind of funny. Or you stick fast USB ports on an XP box. Or you take 7 and you put it in an XP mode and you've downgraded the speed of the processor automatically. Or you've downgraded something on the hardware just by default. Because the operating system is designed to know about the hardware, which is kind of the chicken before the egg game. Because as hardware improves and the operating systems improve, and a lot of people are complaining, oh, I don't like Windows 8. You know, oh, I'm not going to buy Windows 8. I'm going to put XP on everything I own. Then don't buy new hardware. Because <laughs> your XP is not going to recognize any of the new stuff you got on that computer. You might as well just go back to your old computer. There's no sense in upgrading unless you're going to upgrade the operating system. Which is like the chicken before the egg. You know, is it the operating system that's making it run faster, or is it the hardware? Well, you need both, actually, in order to get it correct. So what uh, 8 did for us was give us uh, bug fixes on 7 and took away XP. <laughs> XP downgrades it in 7. So, But it's still much better than Vista or some of the other things. So, And 8 is actually able to recognize multiple CPUs, which is actually a plus, a bonus on top of that as well. So. Because, you know, if you have seven and you have dual processor, unless they're joined together, you still got single processor. <laughs> because the operating system itself just wasn't able, it doesn't know about the resource. It's not configured. Imagine this. You have a program that you write. And you take the program and you run it. You know how the program's going to run. Well, that's the same thing as an operating system. Operating system is nothing more than a computer program that someone wrote C++ <laughs> and installed it. So if the operating system, the program that you're running has no idea that there's three or four different CPUs on that computer, it's not going to, it's going to find the first one and use it. It's not going to look for the other ones. It doesn't know how to deal with the other ones, which is actually kind of funny because people upgrade their computers to more RAM. Like XP couldn't handle something after a certain RAM point. Why buy a bunch of 8 gigs, 16 gigs of RAM when it doesn't recognize it, doesn't even use it? Actually, that was the problem with NT. It didn't recognize more than 4 gigs, I think, you know, which is ridiculous. 
Um, anyway, that's why you need to keep upgrading your operating system because then it's going to recognize the hardware. It's nothing more than the resource allocator for the hardware. So, manages the resources, decides between conflicting requests for efficiency and fairness. It actually will slow down your processor, or it will slow. Its CPU will slow down your processor too. Um, controls for execution of programs, prevents errors. So, if you ever noticed, um, if your fan comes on your computer a lot. And if you've got a newer operating system on it, it will actually downclock your CPU usage because it's working too hard. It's making, you know, to protect the hardware. They call that um, self-preserving mode or something. I can't remember. It's kind of like, you know, when your car, a little fan comes on when your engine gets hot. <laughs> well, computers are now doing that too, which is actually kind of funny. And my beef with the whole Windows 8 thing is that 8 Pro the fan comes on too much if you've ever seen those surfaces so I'm waiting for the next release of that to come out because the operating system isn't designed for tablet it was designed for the desktop so they need to change it to make it more tablet to lower the clock speed it doesn't have to run that fast lower the clock speed, no fan noise, no problem <laughs> I'm actually could probably make it thinner at that point too because you don't have to put a big old fan on it So anyway no universally accepted definition of what an operating system is, by the way. So, uh, everything a vendor ships when you order the operating system is a good approximation of what the operating system is. Everything inside of Windows 8 is the operating system. It varies widely. There is one program, however, that doesn't vary, that's in part of all operating systems, is more than just Unix, is the kernel. So, we have a Windows kernel, we have a Unix kernel, we have a kernel for everything. Kernel is nothing more than the term that means it's the brains of the operation. It's the one piece that sits, that controls all of the other components. So it's like the traffic guard, actually. And then the kernel's got different structures that are st stored inside of it. So one program running all the time on the computer. So what happens? You turn on the power, the BIOS loads the secondary storage because you say, hey, the operating system's on that disk. Okay, loads it up, reads the boot sector of the disk, loads the kernel up in the memory, then the kernel takes over, controls everything else for the life of the program, or life of the running software. It's just one program running after another program. And here's our startup. <laughs> so, we have a bootstrap program. So, for those people who like programming, uh, computers are nothing more than one program running after another program. You put one of the programs on the, on the hardware itself, so when you turn it on, the ones and zeros, you know, electricity flow. Okay, bootstrap. Bootstrap comes up first, powers on, reads the BIOS, says, hey, we got one of these. Hey, we got one of those. Okay. We got a Phoenix BIOS, or we got AMD, or we got all these different variations of different BIOS companies out there. And it's not only maybe about two or three at this point, but uh, comes back, registers everything, reads everything, um, has a little bit of memory on it, stores everything in there, because it's not going to go back and forth. So we have a then we have an MMU unit that it works with as well, loads up the MMU unit. Oh, what kind of memory do we have on here? So MMU is a memory management unit. And we have a bunch of subcomponents. If you've ever taken or maybe you have taken our computer architecture, you'll learn about all these different intermediate components. You have the I.O. buses that can read from it. And long story short, we identify what we have. Then we load the kernel, we tell the kernel what we have, and then the kernel takes it from there. No mystery. Um, and a lot of the embedded systems are run with UC Linux or variations of Linux, which are microkernels that are made from Unix, Linux. So it's actually kind of easy. And then we have uh, Java kernels. You make one from Java. We have Android kernels. Nothing more than a variation made in Android. What does that mean? It's just compiled in a different language, written in a different language, runs in a different language environment. So C kernels, or Linux is a C-based kernel. But there's still a different compiler program for the kernel. What I've done in the old days, and what uh, actually there's another instructor, uh, Richard Greel, Dr. Reel, he um, builds, um, I see his little box is still down over here. So not a bad thing, but I'll do that for the Unix class, but not for this class. But uh, um, look at, see how to build a kernel, and then load a kernel up on blank hardware. You know, and this is for embedded systems. So you can get like a, one of those, what they call them, breadboards, and you can have an EEPROM on there, you just load it load a, a kernel on there and you can see the whole thing operate you turn it into a personal computer <laughs> one's from what they call it single board single board computers so. which are nice actually for the um, they're nice for embedded systems because you don't want to put a big old hard drive on there but now that we have flash memory which is kind of interesting because um, 
your cell phones are still running on embedded memory, you know, hardware memory. But I could see perhaps in the future, you know, the ability to upgrade the operating system on those suckers through, because, uh, you know, if, if you haven't figured it out, some of the some of the Android devices, you can't upgrade them. <laughs> you just buy a new device. But they're only $100 anyway, because everything is on the chips. You know, it's not like something you can pull out or you can reformat, you can upgrade, uh, which is kind of kind of limited, I think. But just put it on an SD card and stuff it in there. <laughs> Which I believe we have a couple phones on the market that are working that way already. So it's just not everybody's phone yet. So, all right. Or you can work through like the iPhone. The iPhone does is they just burn it on there, which is why the whole thing has to turn down and the whole thing has to come back up. It's just reburning. But the more times you upgrade that, actually, it wears it out. It does have problems with it because the SD memory wasn't meant for. It was meant for write once, read many times. It wasn't meant for multiple writing over and over and over again. <laughs> Which is why those little thumb drives wear out all the time. The SD cards wear out. So, all right. So the Bootstrap program is loaded at the power up. See more people are arriving. That's why I waited. So. <laughs> Typically stored in uh, ROM or EEPROM. Generally known as firmware. Actually, initializes all aspects of the system, loads the operating system in the kernel, and starts the execution. So if you've never taken apart a computer before. And even if you have, this is not giving you that much detail. Here's the operation of the computer system and the organization of it. One or more CPUs. So here's our CPU. So uh, our device controllers, our buses, our, our components, our memory. So what, part of what we'll be doing in this class is looking at how to control all these little devices together. So I'll take all the little components and make special controllers for it, put it all together, and call it an operating system. Then we're done with the course at that point. So what are we looking at then is the I.O. devices and the CPU that can execute concurrently. Well, here's a trivia thing for you, actually. When you look at this and you imagine how modern day computers run, and we compare it to the op we compare it to the microwave oven. <laughs> Most people think a microwave oven runs in serial, and you can get that, right? You press this one, you press this one, you press this one, and you press start, and something happens. You know, the motors come on, and the food turns around, and it stops, makes a noise, and you start it all over again. What's the difference between that and the personal computer? No difference. <laughs> we still have serial, just like when you walk, when you leave today, just say, my personal computer is just like my microwave oven. It is. <laughs> Seriously, only one command at a time ever gets processed. We have serial. For one CPU, we only have one instruction operating at one moment of time. But we have this illusion that we have all this other stuff going on. You know, we have the windows and the, the programs that are running, and everything is, seems to be working. Mm -mm. So we have an entire chapter on what's called CPU scheduling, which we don't have on a microwave oven. We don't have a CPU scheduler. We don't need a scheduler. It's one, two, start. <laughs> it's all serial. The operation is serial, but we don't have serial operation here. So we load up Word. In fact, here I've got uh, preview. I've got some recording software going on. i got uh, probably email in the background. i got all this stuff loaded. My CPU is constantly working, which means it's going to consume more power than my microwave. Well, no, my microwave oven's got like stuff on the inside. It's got hardware that's going to consume more power. But the little thing itself lasts forever. Hardly ever does the little battery that stores all the programming for that, does it ever wear out? It wears out more often in my watch than it does in the microwave oven. You know, for people who have battery operated watches, you only got to change it like once a year, once every couple of years, depending upon the quality of the battery. Well, that's because the operating system inside the watch is using the battery. <laughs> Keep, it's running through a cycle of stuff that has to do, and it's, it's responding to commands and stuff like that. Not too many commands, but you know, most operating systems, though, on microwaves are controlled by power because you need power anyway, so you don't have a battery on the microwave. But you have a battery on the computer. You still have batteries on computers, actually, but they never wear out anymore either. They get recharged automatically for us. But long story short, the point that I'm trying to make is that even on our desktop computer, just like the microwave oven, we have serial operation of everything. We don't have multi-processing in anything. Then when the CP, double CPU came around, we, then we had true multi-processing. 
So if we have more than one CPU, we have more than one CPU scheduler, we have two jobs running at the same time instead of one. So we'll spend an entire chapter talking about that. But the funny thing is, though, you have hardware that has two CPUs, but you have Windows XP on there. You only have one CPU working. <laughs> if you have seven, it might switch back and forth between the two, but you still only have one CPU working, which is why people like the, the Droid. So, and people, you know, you see the commercial, the Droid Bionic, and the whole, you know, it's because they have multiple CPUs, and they have multiple schedulers, and they certainly have multiple processing happening simultaneously. So the, some of those devices are more powerful than the older generation notebook computers, <laughs> and much more powerful than your microwave. So yeah. You're going to go home and look at your microwave a little bit differently today. <laughs> it's just like your personal computer. <laughs> But you don't want to carry your microwave around with you, it's too big. <laughs> Plus, it doesn't have email on there or a web browser either. Although, you, you know, have you seen those refrigerators? They have the oh, screens on them now, the email, and you can do email and watch TV on your refrigerator. Why not? It's all true convergence, but that's a different class. <laughs> that's engineering management coming up at two. <laughs> all right, computer system, uh, what do we do here? Concurrent, uh, you, okay, so. The illusion of the single CPU that's processing multiple threads simultaneously. So when we get into the thread chapter, so chapter number one is all about the introduction, which is what I'm covering now. Chapter number two, I start looking at threads and processes because for a multi-threaded, multi-functioning, the way we get serial into the illusion of it not being serial is to create threads. So desktop computers, every single one of them, desktop operating systems, it's nothing more than an orchestration of multiple running threads, multi-threaded programming, which started with Windows a long time ago. Um, so we'll look at that and how to put the threads together to create this illusion of multiple CPUs running simultaneously. And then we'll look at the device controllers and which one is in, is in charge of what and the ability to load a driver for it and then tell the kernel about this driver and then the driver support is controlling our access or our abstraction through the hardware. So we'll take a look at that as well, also in the coming chapters. Um, memory, local buffers, CPU moving memory in and out, looking at memory. All these components actually work together, so CPU schedules work with memory managers. Look at memory managers, memory management schemes. You know, first in, the first out, the round robin queues, and the whole way of scheduling memory to work. And in device controllers as well. And then we'll take a look at, and in fact this is going to come up next week, is the, uh, the concept of the interrupts in the system calls. So the hardware speaks to the operating system and the operating, speak, operating system speaks to the hardware. So, and it's through the driver interface, which we'll look at in a lot more detail when we start looking at the kernel next week. Uh, which is, uh, you know, after the introduction stuff. But, and long story short, <coughs> if the CD-ROM drive is broken, it sends a flare up called an interrupt and it'll send it up to the operating system it just keeps sending it sending it until the operating system catches it so it's very mechanical actually so the operating system will have a kernel will have what's called an interrupt table that will have a bunch of interrupts in there that are pre-identified and then we'll have a queue so the stuff comes up captures it saves it and goes, hey, what is this well it means the CD-ROM drive is broken or the door is stuck can't shut the door on the CD-ROM drive. Okay. And then the kernel will send something up to the user mode. So it goes from hardware to the operating system, which is the traffic guard, and the operating system all the way up to the user mode. And that's how the little message shows up. Hey, CD-ROM drive won't close. Or close the CD-ROM drive or something to the user. So we have this chain of command and the chain of interfaces. And the functions of the interrupts so is our basic communication with the hardware. And then we can go from user mode down through system call. So before I was talking about how we can create uh, systems programs and application programs. Application programs don't normally speak with the operating system. They write on top of the operating system. They provide you with word processing, web browsing, stuff like that. Then we have programs that are called system programs that actually talk to the system. So they go down into the operating system and then they can talk from the operating system. The operating system can talk to the hardware. So you can write a system program to control a playing of a CD or something like that, or manage the network connection or something. So by definition, the interrupts, they transfer the control. So we have an interrupt service 
and routinely uh, through an interrupt vector which contains addresses of all the different service routines. And then we have the interrupt architecture. Um, so I'm going to save the addresses and interrupt instructions. Then we have the incoming ones that are, I might disable other ones. And then we have a trap, which is a software level interrupt. So I'm going to have an entire lecture on this within the next couple weeks. It's going to go into the concept of the interrupts and the system call interface. And uh, I'll draw a little diagram out there. I call it, uh, it looks like a Texas cheese toast. Never seen Texas toast. I think it's called cheese toast. It's in the freezer department. You need to stick it in the microwave. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't really have a mic. I don't even own a microwave anymore. But anyway, long story, I should buy a microwave now because I need to do some Texas cheese toast. The reason why I call it Texas cheese toast is because we have a big old piece of bread on the top, big old piece of bread on the bottom, with a big old piece of cheese in the middle. It's really yummy, actually, if you like cheese. And the cheese kind of hangs out a little bit on the sides and kind of droops down when you put it in the microwave. <laughs> but it's kind of like the operating system. So the cheese in the middle is the system call interface. So the interrupts come up through the cheese, and the system calls go down from the top of the bread down into the cheese. Anyway, I have a nice little um, lecture on that, actually. So um, it's a good thing that this class is right before lunch, which is good. Because so, I'm starting to get hungry now, I'm thinking about cheese toast. Nothing like hot cheese out of the microwave oven. <laughs> anyway, long story short, that will uh, give you everything you know you need to know about system calls and interrupts <laughs> through check test Texas cheese toast. So, that's what they call it. Anyway, interrupt handling, and that's the cheese toast. Uh, so we've got the, the pooling, the vector system. So I'm gonna kind of skip through that right now. Interrupt uh, timetable. The reason why we look at interrupts is because this is how the hard the hardware doesn't speak in software terms. It speaks in interrupts. So everything from the hardware from an interrupt perspective is controlled by the kernel through some sort of an interface to it. So we'll take some time and we'll look at that in a lot more detail uh, coming up. We also have to consider our I.O. structures and as part of the course we'll take a look. Um, this is not what I'd call a hardware course, however, so what we'll be not looking and comparing a USB versus serial versus SCSI or something, but looking at interfaces to it for kernel support is kind of more the focus of this. So after the I.O. starts, looking at the control of the I.O., waiting for instructions, waiting for the idle CPU, and then uh, looping, running jobs through a job scheduler or CPU scheduling. So And then uh, we'll look at the system call. This is by definition, the system calls a request to the operating system to allow the user to do something. So, allow the user to wait for an I/O operation, which is kind of interesting because we can set up queues. As remembering, as I mentioned before, that our personal computer runs just like our operating system. One command after an, just like our, excuse me, microwave oven operating system. One command after another. So when we have queues for everything, so if I want to use my mouse as an example, I've got a queue for that. I got a queue for the keyboard, I got a queue for the monitor. Everything has to be like run serially, so we have to queue up all this stuff and then we process it. Or we don't process it, the kernel processes it. So each one of our I.O. devices will have some sort of a wait queue. And then depending upon your system wait time, gives you your performance time. Most people consider the wait time from the CPU perspective. Like if you have to wait a long time for a program to load or something. You think, oh, there's a problem with my program. There's a problem with my computer. You know? um, but really, but if the mouse runs really fast, you know, the people don't notice that. <laughs> so it's usually the CPU that's most important. So there's a lot of optimization throughout the years to get that CPU to be optimized. So um, let's see. We have two I/O modes here: synchronous and asynchronous. Um, dealing with uh, when are these requests going to be? Uh, when are they going to be processed? Depends on how we're going to do it. So if we have multiple queues lined up, then we can have things happen synchronously where we don't wait for one to stop before the other one starts. And then we have to really involve our CPU with this because the CPU is going to have what's called a job queue. And it's going to have items in there for I.O. It's going to have for CPU processing, for math coprocessor, for all these different components that it's aware of. So in your configuration, is it going to be who's going to wait the longest for what? <laughs> is how that schedule is going to work. You know, is the I.O. going to process after all the CPU stuff processes, or is it going to do it intermixed along with everything? Are we going to open up a drive, allow it to read or write continuously until it's done with that job before anything else happens? 
You can actually see this on your computer. All you have to do is stick a stick a DVD in your DVD drive and watch how non-responsive the rest of your computer is. <laughs> Most people are in the habit of just putting it in and waiting. But put it in and simultaneously try to open up Microsoft Word or try to do something. You notice everything comes to a complete stop because it's called blocking I.O. So we have blocking and we have non-blocking I.O. And you can actually, once you kind of see, well, how is this operating system really working? And then you can kind of see and you can make things happen and you can actually see it. Like if you put a CD-ROM in and it's blocked, it's going to read until it's done reading. Nothing else on your computer is going to work. <laughs> Most people, though, would sit there and wait, though. They're not going to try and open up something because you're in the habit of using your computer a certain way. So, Well, it's just like when you press the start button on the microwave. That's blocked. It's going to run until you open up the door and stop it. <laughs> and still, you got to clear it in order to stop it, really. So, All right, so here's our synchronous versus our asynchronous mode. We have the user and the kernel. And who's talking back and forth here? And our asynchronous synchronous is happening simultaneously. Asynchronous is happening one, then the other, one, then the other. Not necessarily consistently. So we'll talk about this. And this, this pretty much is the introduction to the course. So we'll talk about all of these concepts in a lot more detail as we go through the course. Device status tables. Each one of our hardware devices is going to have a structure inside of the kernel to keep track of its um, <coughs> its status, what's going on with it, um, you know what's what's happening. These are just an example, some visuals to show you what the status tables might look like for certain things. And this is for disks. Actually, it looks like a card reader, <coughs> a line printer, disk one, disk two, stuff like that. So. Uh, let's see, direct memory access structures going back and forth between uh, different I.O. devices, able to transmit information, closed memory speeds. Hmm. We will also look at storage structures. So, yeah, direct, and memory access itself. Not so much because um, the CPU, excuse me, the um, operating system normally just reads from uh, memory management units or access units. So they're like intermediate hardware components. They're giving you the abstraction of the status and the you know, availability of what's being used, what's not being used, um, kind of, you know, of, of the rest of the hardware. So the abstraction is kind of interesting. So it's very, very much sort of simplified in more modern day computer systems as well. <clears throat> so storage structures, uh, main memory, secondary memory, magnetic disk. Not going to really get into disks because those are going away like the old hard drive, everything's going to be flash memory or if it's not already. So, And not a hardware class either, so we'll just tap on that. Storage hierarchy, we will look at that, however. And the speed, the cost, the visibility between, or volatility between the different types of a hierarchy, different types of systems in the hierarchy. Mm, we'll spend a little bit of time on caching memory as well, uh, which is, <coughs> as I mentioned before, everything closest to the CPU is the fastest but it's the most expensive as well and it's the most fragile as well so we want to build a kind of a nice hierarchy stretch it out a little bit and if we put things on a hard drive as an example we don't want to go back and forth between the point A and point B if it's a long distance we don't want to keep going back and forth so we have different cache techniques that we'll put into the operating system and if the operating system is able to use it then we can utilize it so Certain operating systems use cache more than others, or they're configured to make op more optimal use of it, which is kind of interesting because when you buy hardware, sometimes you can buy a system that has a slower CPU on it, has slower memory, but has a lot more cache on it. <laughs> like a MacBook, as an example, which is kind of an interesting difference between that and the average PC. The cache memory is going to be much more expensive, but it means the rest of the components don't necessarily have to be as fast. Because what we're going to do is take all that stuff and start going back and forth between it, store it locally. <laughs> store it a little bit closer, make it available more often. So there's little tricks that people play between what the operating system is capable of doing and what hardware you've got available. So there is definitely um, a strong relationship between the hardware on the computer and the operating system, which is why the components of a MacBook for a Mac OS X system is going to be a lot different. The hardware component is going to be different. The configuration is going to be a little bit different than your average PC. So, which is kind of interesting because people take MacBooks and they load Windows XP on them. 
And I'm like, okay, this is, doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Just buy a PC if you want a MacBook. But they like the outside coloring or they like the keyboard or the form factor or something. But it's more, it's, it'll run faster, it's more optimally designed for the operating system that actually belongs on it, <laughs> so, which is kind of funny. But people actually do the Hackintoshes, so they'll take um, the OS X and they'll load it on the op opposite direction, they'll load it on a non-MacBook. You can make it work to a certain point, but some of the features aren't available because some of the hardware is different. So. Anyway, here's our storage device hierarchy, you know, looking at the kind of the big picture, and, and I'll have an entire week week lecture on this as well. So this is just an introduction and then caching. So uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Main memory, operating system structures. I'm going to stop actually because now I feel myself kind of rushing through this, but because uh, I'm looking at the time. It's like I promised us out by 12.30. So we'll stop. I'll finish my introduction next week because we'll have some new faces as well. Uh, so I'll probably back up a little bit and repeat some of the stuff I already said just because I started rushing through it. But uh, All right, so uh, we're done with this class. However, don't rush out the door because you got to make sure you sign that attendance roster. Otherwise, it's a waste. You didn't even have to show up today. So I don't know how she wants to do it. Here, let me stop this video. I don't know how she wants to do 